So today, the new stuff is about parametric equations, and I'm excited to show you what those are. But before we do that, let's talk about the lab for a minute. I did change something about this lab from last year, and therefore, I want to call that out right here. It says, using the distance formula, and you didn't see that, did you? Because I didn't want to mislead you that on that. The distance formula could be used, but it's way more complicated. How did you find the distance between those roots? Let's imagine this is that three-third roots thing, and you graph them, and they look like this, and this, and this. How did you find the distance? We used the what? Law of cosines. Good. And if this is this lab, just to clarify, this lab is only about the roots of one. That's the only root we were doing first the three third, root, third roots of one, and then it was the four fourth roots of one, and then it was five fifth roots of one. One was the only number possible. And therefore, all of these radii, what are they always? One. Okay? So if those were always going to be a one, then in a formula like law of cosines, to go between these two points, you know the side angle sandwich, it depends on a one and a one, always. They're always one and then the angle. And then I had you generalize the angle. I'm not going to reiterate that right now. If you didn't get that, you'll have to go look at previous videos or talk to other kids. Okay. Generally, this angle based on n, it's not hard to figure out what that angle has to be based on n. Then, lastly, once I have this angle generalized based on n, then getting this distance generalized in terms of n, will look something like this. I'm not saying this is the right answer, but once you solved, which, which formula again? The law of cosines? The law of cosines, you solved that puppy, it always has a square root of, and again, this is not the right answer, but let's say it was n times cosine of 2n or something. That's a general formula for the distance, and that's what we wanted. If I was stuck on this, I would have the law of cosines written out, I'd have a general picture here and figure out generally in terms of n what each little piece is. All right, that's all the advice I'm going to give you on that. That lab is due uh, for us in a few more days here. I'm going to say on Friday of this week. Okay, uh, there is a polar lab which we haven't graded yet. I just want to remind you, do you remember the polar one where I had you make these cool pictures on polar? That's still something I can grade, so have it handy. If you look it up in the polar unit, it was probably day one, I think, of the polar unit, but I'm not creating that right now, just reminding you. It was a cool-looking picture, and a lot of times there was, like, petals, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know, that's not, let me finish it, there we go. Uh, and you took a picture of it, and then you took a picture of your equations, and then you took a picture of the window. So anyway... That polar lab is still out there. There's now a parametric equations lab. I'm not going to sign it yet. You don't even know what a parametric equation is. But there is this lab, and it's again, it's another pretty picture. It's not going to be a rough one. You just have to learn how to graph in parametric. Okay, so that's a different lab coming up sometime in the next week or two here. All right, so let's get to actually like what we're trying to learn here today, which is parametric equations. Find this slide right here. Okay. Parametric equations is always a set of equations that get graphed together. It's called parametric equations, right? That's what, one of the things that makes it different than just normal equations. Okay. Another thing that makes it different from normal equations is, think about it, have you ever graphed anything that did this before? They couldn't do that before. They wouldn't pass the what? Vertical line test. But in the real world, do you get that things aren't as simple as we've always been graphing them? Like, for instance, a bird. Couldn't a bird make that path? It could be flying up for something and then fly down and then swoop back up. 
Well, we, if you use more complicated sets of equations, you can get things where they double back on themselves like this. You can even make it much more complicated. If you want to involve uh, three-dimensional, you could say that first it was at this point, then it went to this point, then it went over here and up there and down here, and you know you can make things much more complicated. So by adding an extra set of equations, having two equations like this that we graph, that's going to uh, give us more possibilities. All right, so next thing you got to understand is that when you graph this thing, the T is not on the graph. I want you to think about that. We have an X and a Y, right? X and a Y. How could we graph the T? We can't unless we say when it happened. Like, for instance, this might be time equals zero right here. And the next point we take was maybe it was up here at time equals one. And then maybe it was down here at time equals two. And then maybe it was right here at time equals three. Up there at time equals four. Do you get what I'm saying? It's a separate thing. The X and the Y are graphed, but the T, T is like the time. And the T can be labeled in here like this to add that piece of information. But you can really, if you're only going to do an X and a Y coordinate, you can only graph two things at once, X and Y. All right. Now, another thing that parametric equations allows us to do that we've never been able to do before, and I, I really like this, uh, I need you to understand this. In the old days, uh, you had this graph. Remember these? It was like throwing a ball up in the air. And this would be the height that you started throwing the ball at. We did this in the parking lot. You remember throwing the ball up in the parking lot? And you threw the ball up and you let go at about two meters. So that height was two meters. And then the ball went up and it came back down again. But do you remember that this was time and this was height? So this graph could tell me the time when the ball hit the ground, but this was never the distance away from you. You get what I'm saying? It was always the time, and the only thing we were measuring was the height of the ball. It didn't matter if the ball went a thousand feet that way, away from you, laterally. All that mattered was up and down. So if I ask at this moment, what data do we have? We have its time and we have its height. We never knew how far away from us it was. So a typical one of these was like this. Y equals, and we always use negative 4.9. Can I round that to negative 5? It'll just make it so much easier. Do you get this pretty close to the gravitational constant, but easier to work with in your head? Okay, and then I'm going to say plus uh, 3t, which was the vertical, how fast it's going, you know, up in the air, vertical speed. And then plus, and then what was my starting height? 2. So if I just left it like that, it would be what we did before. You've, you've already done these, nothing new here. Except sneakily, I changed the x to a t. Because in parametric equations, they're always going to have a t in them. Now, what if I wanted to include an element of how far away it is from me. And I didn't want to graph it the same old way. What if instead I wanted to graph it and know how far away the ball was from me? Then I wouldn't be graphing the time. I would be graphing the height and the uh, lateral distance. That's like how far away it is from you. Do you get, if we graph it that way, then it might look like this. Would the height go up? Yeah, probably. You probably threw the ball in the air, right? But this now actually means what some of you probably thought it meant before. It means that's how far the ball was away from you. But if we're going to graph it that way, do you get that we don't have the time on here anymore? This isn't time, it's lateral distance. But we could do this, t 
empty equals zero, t equals one. You see what we're doing here? We're saying, oh, now here's the ball at one second. Here's the ball at two seconds. And let's say it happens to work out perfectly. The ball hits the ground at three seconds, which, by the way, would be an incredibly strong throw because that's that we'd have to throw it way up in the air to make it last three seconds. Not saying you couldn't. There was actually some kids that did it. But Okay, so that's a new parametric equation, and we need something that we didn't have before. Somebody figure it out. They're called parametric equations, right? We need another equation. Somebody figure out what the missing piece is. Okay, I'm stretching you too far, apparently. Or you've got it and you're just too stubborn to say it out loud. We already had an equation that told us why in terms of the time, leading comment. So now we need x in terms of the time. Okay, so if I had x equals 4t, I want you to think about what that would mean. For every one second, the ball is going to travel. Well, keep in mind, this has been in... Because I use negative 4.9, that should tell you, I rounded it to negative 5, that that's in meters. You remember that? If you use negative 4.9 for a gravitational constant, that was in meters. In case you forgot it, now you know it. So then, what does this mean? At time 1, we would be 4 meters, and that's an x distance. That's a this way distance. That would mean it was at 4 meters laterally. So what about time equals 2? Come on, not too hard. We're at x distance, it must be 8 away from us. All right, so are these more complicated? Of course they are. They get two equations instead of one. But they're similar to what you've done before. They just have an x equation and a y equation. All right, so do you remember me saying before that your best friend in graphing was the xy chart? You can imagine that this would also apply here because this is a graph, right? But we don't just have x and y. What else have we got? Because I'm not being very talkative. I really appreciate it, extra effort here. You can do this. We have x and y, and what else? t. So this is a txy chart. I encourage you to do it in that order. t, x, y. Make a TXY chart. Now, in these parametric equations, you'll have two of them. One will be for X, one will be for Y. And then the other T that's buried in the equations is time. Now, it doesn't have to be time, but we're going to use time just because it'll make the most sense for you right now. Okay. And then it'll always say for T... Is and then a lot of times there's real world constraints. Like for instance, do you get in our example here with the ball being thrown in the air that time wouldn't make sense if it was negative, right? So we would say time is between zero and and then when would this problem stop making sense? Say it, come on. When the ball hits the ground. Then do you get, after it hits the ground, and our equations are going to totally change. All of a sudden it's going to start bouncing and things are going to get crazy. Okay, so then it goes from between t is 0 and t is 3. Then that kind of gives you a hint what you should start with on your graph. t equals 0, and then we figure out the x and the y. Then we should probably do 1 and 2. And then, what's the last one we should probably do? The biggest it can be, which is 3. So we're going to figure out some points. When time was 0, time was 1, 2, and 3. And it's got a few equations to stick it into. You put your 0 into the x equation, which is right here, and then you get 4 times 0 is x must be 0. 
But you put zero into this equation, those two parts cancel out, and y equals 2. Do you get 0, 0, 2? But we don't graph this one. Remember? This one is not graphed. We just label it like this. And I know that point was right. Now, at time 1, let's figure out what x and y are. I'm going to pause for a second while you figure those out. Pausing. Now, by now, I hope some of you are realizing I was totally making up these points on the graph. They weren't necessarily at all there. In fact, at time equals 3, was the ball still in the air? You know how you could tell? Which tells you in the air, the x or the y? The y. When you stuck in 3 into the equation, was y still positive? When you stuck in a 3 here and here, what did you get? Negative like 34. So that means the ball's not in the air anymore. And it's imaginarily going through the ground 34 feet down. Get what I'm saying? All right. So this graph does not match your data. But let's get your data straight. For the one, now let's call on a dice of destiny roll here. Ooh, roll one, person one. What would you get for the one? Uh, X, X was four. Y was? Zero. Raise your hand if you had four. Zero. Awesome. Now let's interpret what that means. Four feet what? Four feet, what's X? Four feet away from us. The ball is now four feet away from us, and its height is what? Zero? What does that mean? It's ball, the ball has hit the ground already after one second. Now let's think about it. Does it really make sense? This was only tossed up at three meters per second, okay? So it was a pretty weak toss. Could you make something go three meters in one second? Yeah, it's a very simple little, little child toss, okay? So it would only be in the air for like one second. Doesn't that make sense? Okay. All right, so two, all of a sudden, the x distance, in theory, keeps getting further. Is it possible, actually, that it's going to get further away from you as it's rolling on the ground? Yes, it is. But it can't go negative on the y because it's the ground. It's not going to go below that axis, right? It can't go down here, really, in the real world. But when you stuck in two, that was easy to do here, and it was eight. And it's like the ball is still rolling. Now, in the real world, would it roll forever like this? No, that's why we have this constraint. We're not going to go forever. We're going to go to time equals 3. When you put in time equals 3, 3 times 4, 12. And again, these numbers became negative, which were actually nonsense numbers in the context of our problem. But the ball ended up 12, sorry, actually these are meters, 12 meters away from us. Does that seem possible? Yeah. All right. So, now maybe maybe it should have slowed down more than that. There is a lot more to the real world. We could add in drag and, you know, like, was the ball made of something fuzzy so it slowed down as it rolled? Or was it on a pool table and it was a perfectly round ball? And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things you can do to complicate it. The main moral of the story is, do you get that parametric equations have two equations? One's for what, one's for what? One's for x, one's for... Why? They're both in terms of another letter called T, which we're going to use and say is, is what in our real world problems? Time. Does it have to actually be that? No. Then, if you make a table, you're always going to make an XY table with a twist. It's going to be a what? A TXY. And then, if you're going to do the times, you better obey what it says, which, like, here's a typical one x equals 4x plus 3, and y equals, uh, oh wait, I did that wrong, 4t plus 3, and y is equal to uh, uh, t squared minus, or plus 7, there. Okay, and it always has a little limitation. Can anybody 
tell me what it's called, the map word for a limitation like this, the T has to be, let's say in our context, between zero and two. What, what would that mean? There's a word for that. There's a math word for that. So it's a D domain. The domain. It only makes sense between here and here. These are the only numbers that will work between zero and two. And you would say zero for time one and then two. And then you'd figure out your points and you could graph them. And now graphs can do more than they used to be able to do. Okay, last concept. Could I change this? into one big equation to rule them all. Not without losing some data, but you can. Think about it. Let's just say it's the ACT, and they say to solve this system. Give me some thoughts. What could I do to solve that system of equations? I think you just heard solve them both. What? For what? T. Solve them both for T. Once I have t equals something on the top and t equals something on the bottom, do you get then, once I have them both equal to t, then this part has to equal this part? See what I'm saying? You could solve the equation, but the problem is, then your t would be gone. And this stuff is only going to have x's and y's in it. This is not right, but let's say it was like that. Get how the t's would disappear? So when you change a parametric into a regular equation, you just solve both sides for t, and then set them equal to each other, and you got an equation that doesn't have t anymore. But way to go, you just lost data. Because parametric equations are more cool, they have more data in them, than regular equations. But yes, you could make this a regular equation. Would you please solve that one for t, and yes, this one's got a little complication because it has a square root involved, but solve them both for t, And once you're done with that, we'll tell you what to do. Solve the top one for T. Solve the bottom one for T. Watch out, the bottom one's got a complication. You should probably really show this, so x equals 4t plus 3, subtracting 3 from both sides, x minus 3 equals 4t, and then dividing by 4. You can either do that with a big divide by 4, or you could divide each little part by 4. You know, x divided by 4, and then 3 divided by 4. Either way is okay. There, t is equal to that. x minus 3 over 4. Notice, no t's anymore, because it's t equal to that. Then, the other one. The other one is y equals t squared plus 7. Subtract 7 from both sides. y minus 7 is equal to t squared. Then square root, square root. Who remembered this is the absolute value of t? Please remember. Please, some of you. Okay, I got three people. Oh, got to remember when you do square root of a variable, you get absolute value. It's going to come up over and over and over and over and over. And it's already come up four times on your tests. I don't know if you've noticed that, but... It's a big deal. All right, so square root of a variable leads to the absolute value. And I know that's not super easy to like picture or imagine, but I'm going to now break it into my two equations. That's what absolute value does. The first one is just without the absolute values. T equals square root of y minus 7. But there's another answer, which is t equals what? The opposite of this. Negative square root of y minus 7. There, I got two equations for that one. t equals square root of y minus 7 and t equals negative square root of y minus 7. All right. That was a tough one, but I wanted to keep that whole squared thing going that I had been doing earlier. Do you get there wouldn't have had to have been a squared there? It could have just been like a 3x, and then it would have been a lot easier. Now I'd set this equal to this. 
and you can square both sides without a worry. So you'd set that equal to that, square both sides, and then you could have an equation that has x's and y's in it. Notice again, if this equals this, I have an equation that's got only x's and y's in it. That's called changing a parametric equation into rectangular. Okay, there, you've learned everything. Let's go to your homework and see what that's like. I'm going to pause while we get there. They call it convert to function form. Okay, so when they ask you to solve this, notice they didn't use a squared because they didn't want to add, make life complicated. They would just have you solve this one for t, solve that one for t, and then set them equal to each other. Much easier. All right, so let's get to the homework here. I'll pause it. Okay, here it is, assignment day one. Plot the set of parametric equations by hand. Not even going to break out the calculators today. Okay. And remember your best friend in graphing is the XY chart, but for the parametrics, it's the what? TXY. So let's make that off to the side here. The TXY chart. And what times would be the logical ones to use? Well, use the domain here. It's only allowed between... 0 and 1, okay? So I'm going to go t is 0, and then t is 1. Now, I know it says convert to non-parametric form. That's a separate thing. We'll do that later, okay? So if we have 0, I put in 0 into this equation, and I get what for the x? Uh, negative 3. I put 0 into the y equation, and I get negative 2. Now I'm going to put in 1. Put in a 1 here, and I have 4 times 1 is 4 minus 3. 4 minus 3 is 1. And then I put in a 1 here. 6 minus 2 is 4. 4. How am I supposed to graph that? Remember, it's the x and the y that get graphed. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. And negative 3, comma negative 2, dot right there. And then 1, 4, over 1, up 4, dot right there. And this was at t equals what? 0. And this was at t equals what? 1. And then it's just a straight line. Now, how do you know it's just a straight line and not a curve? Because there wasn't anything squared in our problem. These were just linear. Now, I need you to take a moment now and do this convert to non-parametric form. And I think you're going to see something cool when we convert this into a normal equation. If I convert this to a normal equation, this has to be solved for t. This has to be solved for t. Set them equal to each other. You'll have a normal equation. Go ahead and do that. I'm going to pause for a minute while you solve this one for t. Solve this one for t and then set them equal to each other. I wish there was more room for you. You can always add a page if you need to. Take your time. I'm not going to assign that many of these. What's critical is that you get the difference between a normal equation and a parametric, because you can make this parametric into a normal equation, a function form. But it's got a limitation that you have to understand. I'm going to pause while you convert this parametric into a regular xy equation. And by the way, solve it for y. If you haven't already, once you've got your equation, solve it for y. If you're stuck at a minimum, what I expect you to see, to see you doing is solving for t on the top one and solving for t on the bottom one. Everybody can do that. <laughs> Here we go. So by now, you have solved this for t. You hopefully added 3 to both sides. You had x plus 3 equals 4t, and then you divide by 4, divide by 4. You got it solved for t. How many of you had x plus 3 over 4 as part of your answer? Okay, then the other one, once solved, this one, would be y plus 2 over 6, and then this has to equal this. 
Could you just leave it that way? Well, you could, but that'd be really boring because you wouldn't see this beautiful thing that's about to happen. I'm going to solve this for y. That means I'm going to multiply both sides by 6. Has anybody got it all simplified down? What did you get? Front row? 3x plus 9 all over 4. I'm going to make each part over 4. Plus 1. I don't understand. Do you mean it's 3x plus 9 over 4, and then you want to add 1? Okay. All right. Let me let me just show, okay, maybe just, I have a feeling you're right, and just that I should probably simplify it a different way. I'm going to now, uh, just for now, I'm not crossing this problem off. You're actually doing that problem later, but for right now, I'm just going to use it as room to work x plus 3 over 4 equals y plus 2 over 6. Would you agree that multiplying by 6 would be a good way to start to get the y alone? Okay, so I'm going to times by 6 here, times by 6 here. That cancels that. Yay. And now this, I'm going to put a parenthesis here to make sure I don't mess that up. And then I'm going to do a little canceling because 2 times 3 is the same as 6. If you can factor it, you should because things, good things happen. A lot of times canceling. Those twos can cancel. Yay. So now it's 3x plus 9 over 2 is equal to y plus 2. Okay. You get what just happened there? I just distributed the top here. 3x plus 9 over 2. Any question? All right. If I hadn't canceled the 2, the numbers would all just be bigger. Okay, they would all be two times bigger. So this would be 6x plus 18 all over 4. But I already did some canceling. Okay. All right, then I'm going to subtract 2. So 3x plus 9 over 2 minus 2 is equal to y. And now to subtract 2, i got to get a common denominator. So that's the same as subtracting 2 means subtracting 4 over 2. And now I have... 3x plus 9, and then the minus 4, the minus 4 plus 5, all over 2. And now I'm going to move my screen up just a little bit, if it will let me. Good. 3x, 3 over 2x plus 5 over 2. Now, that is not a very nice equation, but... Think about this for a second. Do you get this? Do you see this line right here? That line right there? And I'll draw it in a different color so it stands up more. I'll draw it in in red. Do you get that that line right there is this equation right here? That's that line. But wait, this line would go forever in both directions. Do you get that there's a limit on the line? The limit on the line is that it had to go from, and now let's, let's put a limit on this line, otherwise it won't be accurate. If you just had that, it would be wrong. It can only go from where to where? From here, which x-wise is from here. X has to be between negative 3 from here to here, which is at 1. Now, I think a lot of you got how to solve this thing because you saw that you just solve each of them for T and then set them equal to each other. And granted, the algebra is a little bit icky, but do you get why it can't? Keep going forever. This line would go forever. If you're truly going to match up with this original problem, t was only between 0 and 1, so this can't just go forever. So how do we do this the easy way? If we say x equals t, x is like the t, x gives us our limit, we can take it right off the chart. x is like the t. Remember how time goes across the bottom and x goes across the bottom? Then 
this equation's restriction is that x has to be between this and this. So once again, the xy, in this case, txy chart, is our friend because it tells us our limitation. It has to start at negative 3, and then x cannot go past 1. It's just like the t limit, except it's using x. Okay, so there's one from start to finish. It involves solving complicated equations, which need common denominators. And it's not like a walk in the park, but it isn't incredibly hard either. All right, so step one on you doing this problem, problem two, would make, make a TXY chart again. And I know the easy part, if you just had to graph these things, it isn't that bad. You find a couple points between 0 and 1, and you graph them, and you draw a line between them. That's the easy part. The hard part is converting it to non-parametric form, where you solve each equation for t, you stick them into outside each other, and then don't forget to write the domain. This one's domain's from 0 to 1. Then that means there's an x domain. You can get it right off your TXY chart. These two numbers are really critical because that's the limit. X has to be between this and this. Okay, there you go. This is something you would not have gotten in regular pre -calc. Now you can understand much more advanced graphs. They got much more information built into them. They got the time it's at this point, for example. And so far, we're just doing linear ones, which is pretty easy. Then, on this page, we get into a couple that are squared. Now, judging by how much time we have left, I'm looking at how big the assignment is, trying to figure out how far I can ask you to go. We are not going to be graphing any with the graphing utility today. Um, we'll do some of that tomorrow. Um, I think it would be really good for you to think about this in the context of a trig equation. You still use a TXY chart, and since it tells you it's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, there you go. There's your numbers that you're going to stick in for T or T's. It's not super tough. Two number 9, and one with a simple squared, this one. So number 3, number 9. And number two, I'd already did number one with you. It is part of your homework, and I probably will when we grade it. Take something off of that one because I wanted to make sure you actually followed me on this one. So number one is assigned, but to do at home tonight, number two, number three, and number nine. And that's all I got for you for today.